Many thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the organizers for this nice meeting, including the boat trip yesterday. A bit too windy, but it was okay. And just to remind you that uh, today is a day of celebration in France. It's a famous uh, 14 juillet. Uh, it's normally a holiday day, so nobody is supposed to work on this day except some uh, people attending the Think meeting. <laughs> and uh, so um, I have found, uh, oh, okay. I have found uh, something, yes. I have found a nice picture of uh, colored uh, brain cells. Just to remind you that uh, the traditional thing for the 14 juillet in France is uh, fireworks. And uh, I don't think that uh, you can see fireworks tonight, but probably Sounds tomorrow. It's cancelled, okay. So, I will speak about uh, the question of a reward, and I think that the Basal Ganglia is a good region in order to, to discuss about the, the reward processing in the brain. Uh, just uh, starting with the basic function of the reward. Uh, reward is, serves uh, as goals for uh, voluntary behavior, uh, rewards uh, serve as course of positive reinforcers for inducing and maintaining learning. And also rewards uh, elicit feelings of pleasure and positive emotion. So we have uh, different experimental approaches for, uh, in order to tackle the issue of the, the localization of the reward processing in the brain, uh, going from the neuroimaging uh, data in humans to the experimental data in animals with lesion or in various inactivation studies, and uh, the, also the, the recording of uh, physiological indices, mainly uh, electrophysiology, but not exclusively. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the work on, re on reward in the brain is uh, also motivated by the, the description of uh, various uh, behavioral abnormalities which is linked to a dysfunction of reward systems in the brain. One example being uh, the addiction to drugs of abuse. So uh, the um, uh, brain circuitry which is in charge of the processing of reward is a very widespread network, including uh, uh, both uh, cortical and subcortical uh, structures. Uh, some of them uh, have, been long, have been long known as a uh, important structures for motivation and, um, and emotion, such as the uh, amygdala or the orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, today, uh, I will uh, focus on the, the respective contribution of uh, two components of the system, uh, namely the dopaminergic neurons from the ventral midbrain and the striatum. And thanks for the introduction of the uh, previous two speakers, because uh, I can uh, skip probably some uh, some slides. Um, just to remind you that the stratum so it's, uh, is receiving um, uh, information from uh, virtually all cortical areas, but also from the particular nuclei of the thalamus. Uh, the stratum also receives a, a major dopamine input. And uh, as Genela has said before, it exists in the stratum a very uh, special uh, intrinsic innervation which is constituted for, of uh, cholinergic interneurons. It's a specificity of the striatum. And um, the question is, uh, uh, what are the respective contributions of these two, two modu modular systems, the dopamine and the acetylcholine one at the level of the processing which is performed by the striatum? And uh, I will go briefly on this aspect. It's a very famous, iconic illustration of the role of the dopamine neurons in uh, 
detection and prediction of reward. I don't say more about uh, these uh, properties, just to remind you that uh, the dopamine signal coming from the ventral milk brain is classically considered as a signal for uh, as a, an, a reward prediction uh, signal, uh, which is distributed largely on the striatum, but also in many other areas, such as the frontal cortex and also the limbic system. And uh, I, 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 will I will try to, to emphasize some recent data suggesting that the dopamine neurons, the, the, the ideas about the, about the role of the dopamine system are evolving. And I will consider two main points. Two main points. The first one is that uh, we consider now that the dopamine neuron is not at all so homogeneous. And it has been shown, for example, by the work of the group of uh, Ikoide, Ikozaka, that it exists at least two main types of neurons in the stratum. Uh, I don't go in all the details of the task, but it's a really simple Pavlovian protocol with uh, different kind of cues. And after a while, there are uh, different kind of outcomes with various probabilities which are delivered automatically to the monkey. And this is one first example of neuron recorded in this task. I will focus mainly on this uh, aspect. You can see that this neuron is, uh, this neuron, it's a population response, in fact, uh, these neurons are able to to increase uh, physically their activity after the delivery of a positive outcome, the reward, with a modulation according to the level of probability of uh, getting the reward. And the same neurons are able to depress their activity when uh, the, 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 the outcome is, is omitted, suggesting this is classically the criteria in order to define this kind of modulation as uh, uh, indicating uh, the coding of a reward prediction error. This is the first time type of neuron, excitation and uh, inhibition. And in the same area, the group uh, of uh, Ikozaka has uh, also discovered uh, other uh, kind of responses. In this case, in the same task, other neurons are able to increase their activity uh, for, the, uh, the, uh, for the two kinds of outcomes, the positive one and the negative one, but in the same direction. This is clearly different compared to the bidirectional uh, modulation which is seen in this example. And they call this type of neuron as uh, coding the saliency of the event regardless of the valence of the events, either positive or negative. Another... Can I ask you yeah, sure. Yes, I will go. Yes, the other point, uh, maybe this is a point of the question of Alexa. You see that the response for the air puff is consider considerably uh, shorter, the latency is considerably shorter compared to the response to the positive uh, signal. And in fact, the, the second point is the fact that uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of discussion in recent years about the uh, capacity of dopamine neurons to encode the reward prediction error, uh, discussing about the, the short latency of its response, which is not always uh, adequate uh, in order to reflect the complex processing which could be necessary in order to detect the, 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 the error in the, the error on uh, between the uh, outcome which is delivered compared to the outcome which is expected. And in fact, we have uh, recent uh, studies, one of them from a Japanese group, uh, showing that it is possible to uh, uh, dissect the response of dopamine neurons in two main components. Uh, one component is a short latency response, which is uh, conserved which remain identical regardless of the situation. Uh, briefly, the situation is a detection task, visual detection task, and, um, which is based on the 
uh, random dot uh, motion stimuli, and then the coherence between the, uh, in the movement of the dots may facilitate or uh, make the thing considerably uh, more complicated for the animal in order to detect the exact significance of the stimulus, in particular the significance in terms of uh, predictability of reward. And we see that when the coherence is, uh, is increased, the animal is capable to detect that a reward will be delivered. And in this case, you can see that uh, the second component is considerably more apparent compared to the, the other situation where the co coherence is uh, considerably lower. But this different situation doesn't affect the initial uh, component of the response, meaning that uh, the dopamine neurons are able to emit two distinct functional signals, one which is uh, linked to the saliency of the signal in itself, regardless of its uh, uh, motivational value, and a second signal which, uh, uh, which comes out uh, later which is related to the detection of the, uh, the, 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 the value of, of, the, of the stimulus which is presented. And this component is more related to the coding of the reward prediction error. So that is to say, in order to respond to the question of Alexa, the response, uh, the short latency response to aversive stimulus is probably a response to the saliency of the stimulus, but not really to the motivational or the, 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 the value in terms of uh, affective properties. And um, just to show you that uh, this dissociation between two components in the modulation of the dopaminergic tonus has been also evident in, uh, in voltammetry uh, experiments in rodents, showing that it is possible to uh, uh, evidence a first short uh, peak in dopamine release with a short latency, distinct of a more later, more later occurring uh, peak, which is uh, related to the prediction of reward. What about the striatal cholinergic interneurons? As uh, uh, Genela told us before, uh, they correspond to a very particular um, population of uh, neurons in the striatum. Uh, this is uh, two examples of the basic firing patterns which can be uh, recorded in the striatum of the awake behaving monkey. Uh, this has been uh, known since the pioneering work of Malon de Long and uh, Minoru Kimura in the, in the beginning of the 70s. And uh, you have this classical pattern, uh, which is uh, a very low uh, level of firing. And you have, uh, in contrast, this tonic uh, firing pattern. And it is well known, well accepted now, even if we don't have always the definitive proof that uh, each pattern can be associated to uh, two populations of neurons, the uh, GABAergic projection neurons for these patterns, these neurons being able to modulate their activity at different phases of the task when the monkey is actively engaged in, a, let's say, a visuomotor task with neurons activated in advance in preparation of a movement or directly in response to the movement or later for the reception of reward. Con in contrast to the uh, cholinergic interneurons, which are more homogeneous in their uh, modulation because they are only able to express very phasic change in their tonic firing, mainly consisting in the famous pause we discussed before, which can be uh, surrounded by two uh, excitatory components just before or just after uh, the, the pause. And uh, we have shown uh, with uh, Sabrina Ravel that uh, these uh, responses are uh, really uh, dependent of the uh, um, reward prediction context. For example, if the monkey is required to re react to a trigger stimuli by making a target reaching in order to get the reward when it touches the, the, the target, there is a, a nice response to the condition stimulus, but not, no response uh, to the, the, the delivery of reward. And as soon in this task condition, if we uh, deliver the reward at uh, unexpected times, it's very efficient to elicit uh, a response to this uh, surprising reward. 
uh, it's a reward which is given exactly in the same task context, but uh, generally the, the monkey is waiting for the trigger uh, leading to reward in some tries without any warning queue, we give the reward directly in, in, by replacing the reward, by, by replacing the trigger by the reward. In this case, you can obtain in more than 80% of the, uh, the neurons, you can obtain this very nice uh, pause in, uh, in discharge. And so, from this point of view, it seems that the dopamine neurons are uh, functioning in the same way as the striatal cholinergic internal neurons, even if the response is not as exactly in opposite uh, direction. And uh, uh, as uh, the group of uh, Agai Berman, with the work of uh, Genela, has shown, it seems that uh, the the, the, the two modulation seems to occur at the same uh, moment in, the, in time. Let's say that the phasic increase corresponds to the phasic decrease uh, either for the signal or, or for the reward. And um, we, we know also that uh, the dopamine neurons are uh, not only um, uh, sensitive to the prediction of an event, in occurrence, the, the reward, but they are also uh, very sensitive to the temporal context of the delivery of reward. This has been shown by the group of Wolfram Schultz, uh, showing that for the same dopamine neurons recorded in different blocks of drives, they simply change the temporal interval between the, 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 the last event in the task, uh, in fact, the, the, when the monkey is touching the, the liver, and there's a delay, which is habitually uh, in, in the order of, of one second. You don't see a very clear response in this case. And unexpectedly, for a block of, uh, let's say, 10 tries, the delay is prolonged. You can see the, 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 the depression in activity which is related to the coding of the negative aspects of the prediction error, but which is followed by the uh, clear response to the new uh, timing of delivery of the reward. They reinstate the initial interval. The reward is not so clear. They shorten the, the interval. The reward is appearing, and so on. And we have done the same kind of uh, manipulation with the cholinergic internal neurons, and in fact, they uh, function in the same way we are not in an instrumental task, but in a Pavlovian conditioning situation with one stimulus, which is passively followed by the delivery of reward. In this case, you have a good response to the conditioned stimulus, but no response to the reward. And as soon we change the habitual uh, temporal relationship between the conditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, you can see the response to rewards, which reappears without affecting the response to the CS uh, before. So in this way, it seems, uh, according to the sensitivity to the temporal context, it seems that the, um, the both kinds of neurons are uh, responding in the same fashion. And uh, we have uh, explored in more detail the influence of the probability of reward in order to, to find more um, arguments uh, suggesting that uh, the cholinergic internal neurons are able to code uh, the reward prediction error because there is some co uh, contrasting results in the literature which are probably linked to the nature of the behavioral paradigms which have been used. So we use a very simple one. Uh, Pavlovian condition procedure, one stimulus, visual stimulus, preceding the delivery of reward with a, a one second interval. And we are changing the, the, the probability of delivering the same reward uh, on the distinct blocks. And we have, um, in parallel, a behavioral correlate in order to look at the effect uh, on the condition uh, behavior of the animal on, in this simple condition. We can measure the leaking movements and showing that the movements are always more uh, stereotypic and more, uh, with a more <coughs> constant latency compared to the case where the reward is delivered uh, very infrequently. And we have shown, for one example, we have shown that the response in these different blocks with a various probability of, of reward, we see that the response to reward is more and more increased when the probability of reward is lowered. And this is a response uh, at the level of population. And uh, we have found 
for the delivery of reward, a clear uh, gradation in the magnitude of the response according to the level of probability. And you can uh, notice that the, the different components of the response are uh, more or less sensitive to the degree of probability, but I will go uh, further on this detail uh, afterward. Uh, one aspect which is interesting also is to, that the effect of the probability of reward is uh, truly context-dependent because it's very nicely found in the Pavlovian conditioning procedure, but is uh, considerably less expressed when we go to the instrumental task condition, for example. The response to the condition stimulus is not at all affected, it's always present, but you can see that the, the response to the following event, the reward itself, is considerably less uh, well expressed compared to the situation in the uh, Pavlovian protocol, except maybe for the late component of the response, the excitation which follows the pause. We have looked to the possible presence of uh, uh, negative, the coding of a negative prediction error uh, by looking at the unrewarded trial in this uh, condition. The effects are not really convincing, at least at the level of individual neurons. For example, we can find some neurons, just like this one, which are able to express a very mild depression in activity, and we can find also neurons which are able to express a very mild increasing activity at the expected time of reward, but in this case, no reward is apparent. So it's more or less present at the level of the coding at the population level, but it's not always clearly evidenced in the at the level of individual neurons, suggesting that the coding of the prediction neuron in the negative domain is not very uh, a, a good job for the cholinergic neurons, but it's probably also the case for the dopamine neurons. Can you say what's the scale of the ordinary noise plasticity? The ordinate is about 10 Hz. Uh, so, one point is apparent on the example I've shown to you is the multi multiphasic aspect of the response. Uh, Genela says something about that, uh, the famous triphasic response of the cholinergic interneurons. It's sometimes apparent at the level of individual neurons. I see the initial burst, the pause, and the rebound activation, but it's always clearly apparent when we make a summation on different responses. And uh, it's, a, it's a challenge at the moment in order to, 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 to see if the different component of this response can, be, uh, can result from uh, different inputs exerted on these uh, famous uh, cholinergic interneurons. We have uh, three main candidates. As I told you, the excitatory input from the cortex and thalamus, and also the uh, modulatory influence coming from the ventral midbrain. But there is a recent uh, 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 supplementary candidate with the demonstrations in the last years of the possibility for some uh, dopamine neurons from the midbrain to co release glutamate, suggesting that the fast transmitter can come in play uh, in order to modulate the responsiveness, responsiveness of the cholinergic interneuron. And uh, this aspect is uh, an important one because it's, a f of course, a fast transmitter system, considerably faster compared to the dopamine, and maybe uh, this uh, excitatory component may, may make a contribution to the expression of the TAN response. And in particular, we can expect some uh, differential influences on the different uh, triphasic uh, pattern of response of the cholinergic interneuron. And uh, this has been done recently, on, of course, on slice preparation with the contribution of the optogenetic techniques. And uh, the group of Wieland and colleagues has shown that uh, when you stimulate the dopaminergic terminals in the slice, uh, while you are recording uh, cholinergic interneurons, it's possible to make, uh, to, to evidence a first excitatory 
component which is dependent of uh, glutamate uh, stimulation via an NMDA uh, receptor. And you can also evidence for the second component, the pause response, the a mixed contribution of an MDA and a G2 receptor. And for the late component, it seems that it's only uh, exclusively dependent of the dopamine via uh, the G1 receptor. But a really nice study, of course, it, as I say, uh, it's a slice preparation, it's a, a simple uh, situation, but it shows that the, the dopamine has all the components in order to shape the particular response of the cholinergic interneurons. And uh, of course, what about the main uh, excitatory inputs, cortex and thalamus? Uh, I don't have the time to go in all the details, but also the slice preparation has been uh, considerably uh, explored in order to show the respective contribution of the cortex and thalamus, and particularly the thalamus is able to uh, elicit the, at least the first two components, the early excitation <coughs> and the following pause, uh, when they are stimulated uh, in vitro. And um, so it's just a synthetic view which has been proposed by the group of uh, John Reynolds, uh, suggesting that the uh, thalamic inputs and the cortical inputs, uh, which are exerted, uh, which are connected to the cholinergic interneurons, uh, first of all, uh, are um, mainly distributed in distinct parts of the dendrites of the cholinergic interneurons. And it is supposed that the, the, the more efficient, more rapid um, input from the, the thalamus may be mainly involved in the generation of the first two components of the triphasic response of the cholinergic neurons, uh, compared to the uh, uh, cortical input, uh, which is uh, probably involved in the genesis of the uh, late uh, response component of the cholinergic interneuron. Meaning that, as in the case of the dopamine neurons, we have probably something which is more related to attention and detection of saliency of stimuli versus a more elaborate processing which is probably related to the encoding of the reward prediction error. And uh, I think that Guinea has also made a reference to this study. We have made a collaboration with a group of Andrew Charlotte in Oxford in order to see what is the respective contribution of the simulation of the motor cortex versus the thalamus. It has been shown in anesthetized rats, of course, because it's more simple to do this kind of experiments compared to the awake monkey. And they have shown as Genera told us, that uh, it's possible to elicit the, the, the characteristic triphasic uh, pattern with a stimulation of both uh, motor cortex and uh, thalamus, suggesting that uh, uh, probably in this situation, uh, I mean, uh, under anesthesia, it's not evident to see uh, preferential modulation, for example, of the thalamus uh, on the, the first component and on the ribbon uh, for the, the, the late component. So, I will finish um, just by uh, trying to show you a, a conclusion about the respective contribution of these uh, two neuronal systems, uh, just by uh, emphasizing the common features for the two systems. Uh, first of all, uh, for the sensory detection, for the sense saliency, it seems that both uh, dopamine neurons and cholinergic interneurons from the striatum are able to uh, detect this aspect by uh, their uh, early response component. For the identification and valuation of the stimuli which are presented to the animal, it seems that it's mainly uh, encoded in the late response for both systems. And uh, also for the prediction error coding, at least in the positive domain, it seems that the late response component for both the dopamine neurons and the cholinergic interneurons are also encoded in, the, in, in this aspect. And so, what about the difference? It seems that uh, we can uh, underline uh, dependency on contextual factors which appear to be more uh, crucial for the cholinergic interneurons compared to the dopamine neurons, e even if we can find in the literature the, some data suggesting that the context is also efficient in order to modulate the responsiveness of the dopamine neurons. And also, there's a 
possibly uh, main difference in the functioning of these two systems according to the influence of the motor aspects. It seems that uh, cholinergic neurons can be able to code some aspects related to the execution of movement, the encoding of the spatial aspects of movement. In contrary, the dopamine neurons are not really involved in, the, in these aspects. Uh, uh, I can make a special case of the question of the coding of uh, vigor of movement, which is another aspect in another, another time scale. And uh, finally, for the prediction error coding in the negative domain, it seems that dopamine neurons are better at work in, in this field compared to the cholinergic interneurons, but uh, as we could discuss after. It seems that the dopamine neurons, is not all, uh, dopamine neurons are not always convincing for the encoding of this aspect. And uh, I will finish by uh, stating some questions for the next future. Uh, how do the striatal dopamine and acetylcholine mechanisms work together? According to the work of uh, Hagai Berman, it seems that the, the pause of the cholinergic interneurons and the, the, the excitation uh, of the dopamine neurons coincide, but we know that we have different components of of response, so we have to look in detail what are the coincidence for the different components. Uh, second point, what are the inputs controlling the distinct components? I'll uh, show you uh, there is many data, more and more, uh, with the combination of the slice preparation and the selective activation with uh, optogenetic techniques. And also, uh, the recent, uh, with the recent advent of the uh, of the genetic tools, we have a, a new gift. Uh, what is the contribution of the glutamate coalesce in the signal properties of the striatal dopamine? Uh, and also acetylcholine, because it has been shown that uh, cholinergic interneurons are also able to, 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 to coalesce glutamate, so they are also able to emit a fast excitatory component locally in the stratum. And uh, so a lot of questions for, uh, for the future. I will finish by uh, 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 thanking my uh, collaborators, Marc Defen, Sabrina Ravel, and also my colleagues in, uh, in Oxford, uh, Nathalie Douag and André Charot, and uh, the sponsor of financial support for the delivering us some rewards sometime. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> okay, I'll start by... Uh thanking the organizers for organizing this uh, lovely event and for inviting me. Uh, they asked me to be provocative and to talk about theory, and I'll try to do that. And before I start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people who contributed to this work. Uh, Hanan Steingart and Tal Naiman, two students that graduated from, from my lab, and uh, Lotem Elber, a new student, in, a new graduate student in my lab. People that contributed data to the analysis that I will describe, Ido Erev from the Technion, uh, Randy Gallistel from Rutgers, and uh, Eli Nelkin and uh, Itai Hirschhorn from the Hebrew University. Much of the work of, much of the ideas that I will describe were, were developed in collaboration with uh, Gianluigi Mungillo that is here, and some of it was uh, published in this, uh, in this uh, review paper. So I'm interested in operant learning. And operant learning is not a, 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 is not a, not a new topic. I guess it's the most salient feature here in this uh, figure is this, because uh, this, is what, uh, this is what underlies behavior. And uh, just to prove that this is not a new concept, actually you find it in the Bible, the idea that you can change behavior by using a, a negative negative reinforcers, it's not only in the Bible. This is like, this was common in the Middle East like at least 2,500 years ago, uh, perhaps still common uh, these days. Um, so what's new? What's new about operant learning? So one, one, new, one new thing definitely is our ability to, uh, uh, to record neural activity while uh, humans and animals learn. But another thing that is perhaps new that relates to operant learning is, is uh, something that is called uh, reinforcement learning. These are models that were typically developed uh, in the field of computer science that tell us, uh, um, that, that suggest algorithms uh, uh, for this kind of learning. And broadly speaking, they fall into two, uh, one of two categories. One is a value-based approach 
in which the idea is, is um, uh, that the policy is, is based on, on estimates of, of expected returns or value. This comes from the theory of Markov decision processes. I'll say a few words about this. This is one approach. The second approach is it's called direct uh, uh, policy search. Basically, it says that you want to find a set of uh, parameters of your brain, or if it's a computer, the parameters of your algorithm that uh, optimize uh, performance. So in, in my talk, I will describe two examples that can be uh, well explained in these frameworks. The first one would be experiments on humans. Second one would be experiments on uh, rodents. and. Uh, I will try to spend as much time as possible as discussing the comparison of these two models and some, I will say something about a neural representation. So let's start with the first example. So these were experiments that were done in the laboratory of uh, Do Erev. You have a human. He's presented with two keys. He has to press on one of them, pressed one, got five dollars. Presented with the same two keys, can choose again, got fifty dollars. Again, two options. Now, got chose B, got nothing, and, and so on and uh, so forth. And uh, a few words about the algorithm that he, set, that he used. One key was considered as a safe key. So it was, uh, uh, the outcome of pressing it was fixed. The other key was considered a, a, a risky key. It yielded a high reward with, a, with some probability pH and a low reward with, with, uh, uh, the, the, uh, with probability 1 minus pH. And the numbers were chosen such that, the, uh, that the, the reward associated with a safe alternative was approximately equal to the expectation value of uh, uh, the risky key. And uh, he collected a, a pretty impressive data set of 200 uh, participants, uh, uh, 120 different problems, 100 trials in, in a block, altogether something like a quarter of a million uh, decisions, and this, is, this gives us something to, to chew on. So let me tell you something about uh, value-based uh, framework. So the idea is very simple, uh, uh, um, adopted to this problem. We have uh, an internal rep representation of our expectations from the two alternatives. We'll define it, we'll denote it by, 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 by uh, the letter Q. We use this uh, internal representation to make a choice in a stochastic way such that the alternative that we think is better, we choose with a higher probability. Following our choice, we get a reward, and uh, with this reward, we update the internal rep representation of the values of the two alternatives, such that the non-chosen, the, the internal or the subjective value of the non-chosen alternative remains unchanged, whereas the new, the chosen alternative is updated such that uh, uh, it's, it's a linear combination of our previous update and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, outcome, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the outcome of our uh, choice. So this is, this is, not, a, this is not a new uh, framework. Uh, uh, in this uh, question, in this problem, we, we made, I think, uh, uh, we made two contributions. One contribution relates to the, to the shape of this action selection function. The action selection function is, is a stochastic function that relates these two uh, uh, subjective values uh, uh, to probability. Typically, people use something that is called a softmax uh, um, action selection value. And um, surprisingly, no, nobody tried to, uh, uh, to estimate, to, to estimate uh, this function from, from, uh, uh, from the data. Um, well, I don't know why, but I think that sociologically, this, the reason is that we don't have direct access to the probability. We only have binary choices, and we don't have direct access to this subjective value. This is something in the brain. So people thought that it's impossible to, uh, uh, to directly uh, estimate this function in a non-parametric way. And uh, I will not go into the detail because this is not a topic of this talk. We found a way of estimating this uh, action selection function in a non-parametric way. Turns out that this is something that looks like a, a soft match in the sense that there is some, it's, it's, it's gradual. The, uh, the, the larger the difference between the two subjective values, the more likely you are to choose the, the alternative that you think that is better, but there is a saturation term. So in a similar to, to uh, something that is called epsilon greedy in computer science. Um, 
Second question, second contribution that we made to this framework is, is concerning the, the question of initial conditions of this problem. So uh, I told you that the, the, the way that, that values are updated by uh, combining your old estimate with a new reward. So one can ask the question, how do we start this, how do we start this uh, uh, process? And uh, so considering this difference equation, what are the initial conditions of this difference equation? And, and I think that nobody really uh, uh, estimated because the general, sorry, the general feeling in the field that we, we shouldn't care much about it. We have to do something. So either we choose arbitrary values like zero or we try to best fit our values to the data. It turns out that actually both, both these questions, addressing these questions is important if we, can, if we want to come up with a quantitative uh, description of behavior. But I'll, I'll try to explain why, why initial conditions are, are important. And this comes from, from this result. So what you see here is a probability of choosing the risky alternative. As you remember, there were two choices. One was safe, one was risky. This is uh, the probability of choosing the risky alternative in those cases in which the first choice, the first risky choice was rewarded with a high reward compared to the case where the first risky choice was rewarded with a low reward. And one, one thing that, we can, that you can immediately see from this figure that there is a strong primacy effect. And no, this is not an artifact of, of heterogeneity in the problems that I will not go into it. There's a strong, there's a strong uh, uh, primacy effect. And uh, if we try to model it in this framework, in order to explain the primacy effect, we need, uh, uh, in order to explain this difference, at the very beginning, we need a, a, a high learning rate. If we want to, to explain the fact that, that a, a behavior is sustained, the difference between these two uh, uh, trajectories remain until the end of the experiment, we need a, a low uh, learning rate. And one way of trying to, to, one way of seeing it is to try, oops. Yeah, technology is, is too difficult for me. One way of doing it is to try and, and best fit the data, uh, 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 to, to, to take the model with the best fit initial conditions, and uh, none of the, no, and this such a model cannot account for this uh, uh, weird behavior. Our answer turns out is very simple. Our answer is the first impression, the first value that you get. This is the initial conditions are in fact reset by the initial outcome. Of, a, a, of your choice. So there's something special about the first choice, and it resets the initial conditions. How these, how, this is how the initial conditions are, are uh, determined. And if we take it together, uh, we try to model this behavior, we get behavior that is uh, uh, qualitatively very similar to the, to, the, to the behavior that is observed in the experiment. We can make predictions about um, uh, uh, the, the, the extent to which, to which subject would be uh, uh, risk aversive or risk seeking as, as, as a function of the exact parameters used in the model. We can compare our model to other models and the low number is good. These are all the other models and we do very well, assuming again that we uh, uh, make corrections, we choose the right action selection function and that we have this uh, reset of initial condition. So this is a good model. A very good model for this, uh, uh, for this task. Now let me move on to another task, another operant learning task, uh, which in some sense is more, uh, perhaps more, uh, more natural. These are experiments that were done a long time ago by uh, uh, Randy, by Randy Gallistel. Uh, you have an animal, uh, it presses a lever either on one side of the cage or the other for, for a rewarding brain stimulation. It moves from side to side at will. This is a theoretician's view of how the experiment looks like. Okay, and um, and we'll move from one side to the other. As a theoretician, I don't have any fancy uh, uh, movies to show as, uh, as other speakers. I apologize. Um, so. Let, let me show you some. So, so the reason that the animal uses, moves from one side to the other is that, that uh, uh, in this experiment, Randy Gallistel applied a, a reward schedule that is known as concurrent variable interval schedule. 
without going into the details, what it, what it means that if you are a long time this side, then the, you have an incentive to move to the other side. If you spend a long time on the other side, you have an incentive to move to uh, the first side. So what can you quantify in this experiment? Well, one thing that one can quantify is stage duration. This is a distribution of stage duration on one side. This is a distribution of stage duration on the other side. So there are two things uh, uh, worthwhile noting. One, that the time scale here is 40 seconds, the time scale here is five seconds. So the animals spent much more time on this side than on this side. And the reason was the details of the reward schedule were such that uh, uh, this side was more rewarding in some sense. Another thing worthwhile noting is that uh, these distributions are uh, uh, approximately uh, exponential. So there is a way in this reward schedule to change the, the relative uh, goodness of the, re of, 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 of the two sides. And uh, so this was something that was utilized here. And this is and, and one way of quantifying it is uh, to look at the uh, fraction of uh, time the animal spends on one side as a function of the fraction of rewards obtained on this side. And the different colors correspond to uh, uh, different reward schedules. The uh, different points correspond to different experiments. And, and one can change the fraction of time the animal uh, spends on one side, as you've seen in these exponential distributions. But uh, independently of what you do, all points align uh, approximately along the diagonal. And this behavior is known as operant matching, not to be confused with something that is called probability matching. This is known as operant matching. And it's not unique to this experiment, uh, uh, to these animals. These are just uh, four examples of operant matching that, uh, uh, that you find in the literature, four out of many. This is uh, the first example experiment by Richard Hernstein on pigeons. This is the data that I've just shown you. This is more recent experiments on, uh, on uh, uh, monkeys uh, from the laboratory of uh, Bill Newsom. And you find similar things when considering the behavior of professional basketball players. So it's, it's a rather uh, uh, universal law of behavior. It's not, it's not the law of gravity. Unfortunately, but still, it is something that is that is pretty general. Uh, another thing that that you observe in these experiments, you can uh, um, change you can change the reward schedule. Make one side that was previously richer make it poorer, and the other side make it richer. And this is what has been done at this point in time. And again, without uh, um, going into the details, what you find is that. The, what, what we call investment, a fraction of time the animal spends on one side, drops uh, when this side becomes poor, and, and uh, 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 the animal basically responds to changes in the reward schedule, and it does it uh, uh, pretty quickly. Okay, can we, can we model uh, this behavior? And to model this behavior, we, we, uh, we use the standard model of competing neuronal uh, networks, two populations, each population corresponding to, uh, uh, to, to uh, one choice. And this is a bistable system. And with some noise, it, it alternates from one side to the other, corresponding in our model to shifting behavior from choosing one alternative to the other. There is external input that tells us the, networks, the two networks something about the goodness of the two alternatives. And in our model, we learned the value in quotation, how good the two alternatives are using uh, a covariance-based uh, synaptic plasticity. This is similar to what uh, Elon was describing a few days ago in, in, uh, in his experiment. And the reason that we used covariance-based synaptic plasticity is because in previous work, we've shown that uh, this phenomenon that is known as operant matching is something that naturally emerges uh, uh, when you apply this kind of uh, plasticity rule or this family of plasticity rules independently of, of, of the network structure. And this is all published, and I will not go into the details. Uh, this is not the main, uh, the main point of my talk. But the model, it turns out that this model is a rather good model. So this is, this is a behavior of the animal. You see this is a, a, a distribution of stage duration. This is a distribution of stage durations in our model. This is matching in the behavior. This is matching in our model. These are transitions. When you change the reward schedule, this is, these are the transitions that you observe in the behavior, and these are the transitions that you observe in the model. Uh, more or less, uh, uh, well, it's an, it's an indication that this is a reasonable uh, model 
of, uh, of the animal behavior. And this model also makes some interesting predictions. So I told you that one can change behavior by changing the reward schedule. It turns out that one prediction of the model is that the average, the, the product of the average stay duration in the two sides is a constant. This has to be a constant. This is the result of the model, and we can test it in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the behavior, and we find out, we find that indeed this is an, a pretty good law of, uh, uh, of behavior. Another thing is, another prediction is that the visit cycle, that the, the, the average time that you spend when you, move, when you start in one side, spend some time there, move to the other side, spend some time there, and then move back, this should be proportional to the sum of the square roots of the ratio of the fraction of time that you spend in the two sides. Not something that you would come up with I don't know, from without, well, without a model. And well, this is a data, this is three animals, this is the points are the data, lines are the prediction. Again, the model is not so bad. It explains some, some aspects of the, of the behavior. Okay, so to, to summarize the results so far, I've presented two models, uh, one that is, that is based on value, one that is, uh, 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 is based on covariance, based on applicable plasticity, but this can be thought of as a, general, as a particular example of a direct policy search. Now, well, we want to know in what, in what, to what extent, I mean, the task is not that different. So I want to know to what extent the models are uh, similar. similar. We'd like to compare the two models. Both of them are, are rather good, I would say, in, in explaining the data that they were constructed to, uh, uh, to explain. Okay, so there are differences. The first value-based model is a behavioral model. It only talks about behavior. The second model is supposed to be a neural model. It tells us something about things that take place in networks of, uh, of neurons. Well, it turns out that this is not a, this is not a real uh, difference because there are similar models that have been used uh, uh, and were formulated as neural models. And similarly, I can take my neural model and formulate it as a behavioral model. I'm not explain this equation, but, but just, just as a summary, this is not a, this is not a, a dramatic uh, a thing. Well, one, one uh, would like to know, well, there's, some, there's a difference in the task. So this task was a task in which there were discrete trials. And this was tasked with a continuous time. The animal could, could shift from one side to the other whenever it wanted. So maybe this is a fundamental uh, difference between the two cases. Now, it turns out that applying value-based plasticity to this task is something that is not trivial. There are various ways of doing it, but none is, none is perfect. Um, but definitely, one can apply covariance-based plasticity to this task. And actually, I, I, I've done it in the past. And it turns out that the models are, in fact, fundamentally, fundamentally different. So, without going into the details, this basically, in some approximation, the first model is a model in which the probability of choosing an action is a function of the difference in the values associated with the two sides. In this, another approximation, the second model is a model in which the derivative of the probability is a function of the difference. So the models are really different from one another. So we have two behaviors, we have two uh, models, and well, okay, it, it's embarrassing, right? I mean, it, it is particularly embarrassing because I am a co-author on both papers, or on, 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 on the two families of papers. So what, what the, the next thing to do would be perhaps to come up with, with, with a, 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 um, some general framework that has it all. And, and to, to be able to explain why, in some conditions you get this, and in some conditions you get this, but basically this is this is a, a, this is the truth. But I think that the problem is more even is, is perhaps more fundamental. And I, 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 I'd like to, to 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 talk about now about experiments. Okay, I have problems with with theory, so I'll shift to attacking experimentalists. So I'll talk about uh, uh, the question of robustness of of behavior, and, 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 and I, I told you about the, the matching law, how, how general it is, and how happy I am that I'm able to explain these four uh, uh, families of behavior, and, and, and many more. So just a few, a few words about this, this uh, matching law. Matching law tells us that 
for example, in the monkey experiment, number of times that you choose one alternative divided by the sum is equal to the number of rewards that you receive from this alternative divided by the sum. You, one can rewrite it as n1 over 2 is, a, is equal to i1 over i2, or in the logarithmic scale, log of n1 over n2 is equal to log of uh, i1 over i2. That's a matching law. Well, it turned out that you can do a very similar experiment in monkeys with a concurrent variable interval schedule. These are experiments of Lau and Glimcher from about the same time and get very different behavior. Basically, what they get is that log n1 over n2 is equal to half of log i1 over i2, or n1 over n2 is equal to square root of i1, and, uh, I1 over i2. So this is not as general as I would have liked it to be. So what's the difference between, between this experiment and this experiment? Well, it turns out that the difference is rather small. The difference is known as change over delay. Um, and, and the basic idea is that in this experiment, there's a small punishment for switching from one side to the other. And this experiment, they didn't have it. So in, the, in all the models that we discussed, this is something that is completely ignored. But it turns out that this rather uh, uh, small difference in the reward schedule has a huge effect on, uh, on, on the behavior. Let me give you another example that perhaps is more related to the first experiment. So this is an experiment in which uh, uh, humans were presented with a binary sequence over time. It was a, 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 a drawn from a Bernoulli distribution, basically tossing a coin with some probability, and they have to make a prediction of what would be the outcome of the next toss. And this is behavior in condition one, which I'll explain in, in, in a second. And this is behavior in condition two. And I think it, it's very clear that uh, uh, behavior is very different. And I would like to add that these are the same people, exactly the same people, exactly the same sequence. So what are the two conditions? Well, in one condition, the task of the subject was, was the following. Uh, uh, there were um, parallel lines that were drawn on the floor. The task was to take a rod, throw it in the air, and it will either cross these lines that were drawn on the floor or it will not. And the task was to predict whether it will cross or not cross. And it turned out that the probability of crossing was one, about 1 over pi for these conditions. In the second task, OK, that's my, again, my uh, uh, authoritician's view of, of an experiment. OK, and, and this is the behavior that was observed. Second task, same people were given the sequence of events in the first experiment. This was unknown to them, of course. And this was presented in the form of a lamp turning on and turning off. Again, a binary sequence, the same binary sequence as before. And they had to make a prediction whether on the next trial it will turn on or not. That was the behavior. So the behavior is very different. Uh, despite the fact that from a theoretical point of view, the way that we will model these two tasks would be exactly the same. So they have to make a prediction uh, uh, over time whether it will cross the line or will not cross the line. That would be the one, and uh, this would be this one, and here they would the, whether the lamp would turn on or not turn on. And they do it in one case by observing the outcome of the th the throwing the rods, and in the se second case by looking at the sequence of lamps being turned on and turned off at exactly the same order as the first experiment. Are they throwing the rods themselves? Yes, they're throwing the rods themselves. Now, one way of, I mean, thinking about it, it's not that surprising in the sense that here they know the mechanism, and here they don't know the mechanism. So one way of thinking about it is, is the following way. In, 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 in one case, they know that this is one state, two actions, two outcomes, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, one, one state, if one can think about it, it's two action, one, one state, two actions, uh, mark of decision process, where in, in the other case, they have no clue, and they, oh my god. In the other case, they, they, they in, in the other case, they know, well, they don't know anything, and they can imagine a very large repertoire of different worlds. And this is somewhat related to, to, to what uh, 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 Ganella told us. There's a, the, the, the question is, what is a state? This is a fundamental question when uh, uh, wanting to, to apply these uh, uh, um, 
operant learning or reinforcement learning algorithms, and typically we don't have a clue what is a, what, what the subject thinks about the, the uh, internal or, or the rules govern, governing, uh, governing the world. So to summarize the result, and this is not a summary of my talk, I need more time. Summary as a result, I presented two models. One is value-based and one is direct uh, uh, policy. And uh, I applied it to explain uh, uh, humans and to explain behavior of humans and to explain, in this case, to explain behavior, be, uh, uh, behavior of rats. The two models are, are good models in the sense that they, uh, they explain well the data, they make good predictions, but they're not compatible. They're not compatible uh, 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 with each other. And then I, I, I showed you that the problem goes beyond the models, that, that very minute uh, changes, what looks like minute changes in the experiment, also have a large effect on, uh, on behavior. So now we'd like to ask whether we can be saved, perhaps, by, by recording from neurons. And uh, uh, Ganella talked about, and, and, and Paul talked about, a reward prediction error, which, which directs us to the direction of, uh, of Q-learning. I, I, will, I will present an example, at least, one example at least, uh, that, that the lesson perhaps is that we should be cautious about it. And this is, uh, there is, there is a, some, a family of, of experiments from, from the last decade telling us that um, there is representation of action-specific uh, uh, reward values in the striatum, and uh, those that don't know what action a specific reward value is, in, in this experiment that I discussed, this is a, these cues, these internal values that are used in order to, to, uh, to, make, a, to make a choice. So how, 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 how were these neurons identified? So I will start by presenting a model, how I identify them in model, and, and the same uh, uh, framework was, was used for the real data. So this was a two-arm bandit experiment. You have a monkey, uh, a monkey chooses between uh, uh, two choices, Two, two, uh, uh, two actions, one uh, uh, will result in a high reward, one will result in a low reward, and there's some probability for a high and low reward. And then the, the, after the monkey learns, there's a new block where the, these probabilities change, and, then, and, and so on, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is not experiment, this is model. Basically, you take this uh, value-based learning these, uh, these equations uh, um, uh, for value-based learning, and, and you apply them to this experiment. And uh, it turns out that, uh, uh, well, not surprisingly, it can learn. This is a, the, the uh, uh, probability of option one. This is the probability of second option. Each one of these is a, is a different block, and the model learns. And we assume that uh, there, are, there are neurons that actually code for the action value. So these are the neurons that are exactly these. The firing rate is exactly this. Now, when we do the experiment, we don't really know the action values. We have to infer them from, uh, uh, from, from, from the behavior. And this, is, this uh, thin line is, uh, is, is the value that we infer, which is not too, too um, different from, from, the actual, from the true Q values. And now we can try and correlate the spike count of the, of, of the neurons in the trial, we assume that neurons are Poisson, we can try to correlate them with these Q values. So we do this uh, correlation, and what you see here is a T value of the different neurons in our network for Q1 and T value for Q2. And you see that many neurons code for either Q2, either positively or negative, because we had bo both positive and negative modulation, and uh, we can take this framework to estimate, uh, to, to ask the question, are there Q-value neurons in, uh, in our model? And we find that there are about 20%. The reason that there are only 20% is that, well, the blocks are, are short and firing is Poisson, so, so not all, of course, all neurons were truly true-value neurons, but our, the statistical analysis was able to detect only about uh, 20%. Now we go to the stratum, so this, this is one study, but there are several studies that did exactly this and found uh, similar values. And, and superficially, this would be a victory to the value-based framework in the sense that we have behavior, it works well for behavior, and we have the neural correlate of these internal variables that we are looking for. So this is victory. Well, it turns out that you can take a model that is based on covariance, based on synaptic plasticity, where I can assure you that there's no representation of value, neither explicitly nor implicitly, 
and get exactly the same results when doing this analysis. Well, so, okay. It turns out that it's even worse. Ellie gave, me, gave us a few neurons from the auditory cortex of anesthetized rats. Rats, right? Rats, yeah, it says rats. For me, everything that is furry is, I, is it's the same. I, I don't, monkeys and, and everything is the same, okay? So he gave, he gave us uh, 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 some traces of neurons that were presented with auditory stimuli. They were anesthetized and they recorded neural activity. And we correlated the activity of these neurons with these Q values. And we try to see how many of these neurons are action value neurons. Well, a substantial proportion. Now, I don't have time, unfortunately, to explain to you why this is, why this is happening. Basically, it's a result of, a, a, of, of the analysis that assumes that the, the, that the, the uh, um, fine rates are exactly stationary. Actually, what we are looking when we are doing these correlations, we are looking for non-stationarity non in the fine rate. And if there is any non-stationarity in the fine rate, even weak, we will identify neurons that we will call action value neurons. Now, in all these models, they used, this was, of course, not the only way of, this was not the only way of identifying action value neurons. There were other ways. There were other ways of, of, of a, a quantifying a, a values. Turned out that it doesn't help. It doesn't help, and the, 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 the good reasons to it that I will, uh, uh, I will not have time to, uh, uh, to go into. So the bottom line, okay, bottom line is we have a problem, and we can stop here. Any direct question about this, or maybe we move to the discussion with all speakers of the session? We should probably move to a global discussion then. Well, the bottom line is, uh, well, the, the, we, ha we, have we have a problem. We have several, well, many problems. We have many problems. This was a, a, an example of a case where the problem was a st st statistical analysis. But this is, I think, a small problem. A large problem would be the case of what, how, what, what do you, what, what's the interpretation of finding statistically significant correlation of activity of a neuron with an internal variable in the model. How should we interpret it? Now, the standard interpretation is, okay, these are action value neurons. But this is a very problematic interpretation. It's problematic for various reasons. If a neuron is uh, coding for action value, well, 10% of its firing rate is action value, 90% is something else, still, in this analysis, it will be uh, considered as action value neuron. This is one, uh, uh, one problem. Second, there is a, a, a large family of correlated models that have correlated internal variables, and therefore uh, it will have a correlation uh, uh, with this, may have a correlation with this neuron. So it is very difficult Perhaps unless you do something, unless you work in the periphery, like, I don't know, perhaps primary visual cortex, perhaps in, 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 a, in a motor neurons or, or perhaps primary uh, motor cortex, these are places where I think we are rather confident that we understand what neurons are coding for. But going deep, having a model with some internal variables and then correlating, uh, 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 we, have to, we have to be cautious when we take a model with internal variable, correlating the internal variable with activity of neurons, and then arguing, and if you find statistically significant correlation, then to argue this is a neuron that does this. This is, we have to be, uh, uh, we have to be uh, cautious. But, with but for instance, in the, in the, science, in the science paper you, you presented, which actually by total chance I, I reread two days ago. Okay. The, the, the design of the experiment is such that you know, like they, they place the probability such as they can, for instance, rule out the contribution of uh, left uh, 
uh, uh, uh, movement and it's just about the, the, the reward for it. So here, no, here they kind of like manage to dissociate. No, to his, as, no? Any non, in this specific science paper, any non-stationarity, any slow non-stationarity of the fine grade, even at, at the level of uh, uh, changing, you know, going from uh, uh, 3 hertz to 3.2 and then going to 2.8 and then going back to 3 and then going to 3.1, any non-stationarity like this, which will be extremely difficult to uh, identify in the experiment, will result in a large fraction of neurons which will be erroneously identified as action value neurons. And the reason this is, this is exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for these weak non-stationarities. Can, can, oh. So, if I said correctly, Jonathan, you are frustrated because we still don't understand the brain? Oh, no, that I'm frustrated bec because of the air conditioning. That's why I am. No, I'm right. frustrated. Uh, so, no, I'm, I think that we should be less of... Uh, I think that we should be cautious. That's, that's an important lesson. We should be cautious uh, in uh, applying our models to uh, neural activity and behavior. That's, we should be more cautious than I think that, than I am, and I think that we are as yes. a community. But, but the only thing we can really do with self-centricity is to reject hypotheses. And you started with modeling that had no scientific question behind it. Said, so let, let's try and model it. So essentially, it's parameter fitting. With enough uh, parameters, you'll get it. But you had a prediction and it actually proved right, which is nice, but it still doesn't prove. It may be something that you have to, re to reject. Now you're, you're in a situation when you have two models that, that can account for the data. Your job as a theoretician is to come up with a prediction that can discriminate between the two. Or, or can actually reject both of them, but this so, is where we stand. It, 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 it's, it's a continuous process, it doesn't end. So, it, it, uh, uh, yeah, well, first, yes, I'm, I'm frustrated, but this is not the point. So, first, first the question was not, uh, it was not just fit the data. There were specific questions in, in, uh, in, in these problems. For example, I want to know what's the action selection function, given the, the, this was something that was unknown. Oh, I'm presenting it not in the right historical order, but that's, uh, 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 that doesn't matter. But, but I think that there's an issue here that goes beyond the, my, my failure in modeling. And the issue is that there are aspects of behavior that don't seem to enter the models. And this would be all these, all these cases where uh, very, what, what lo looks like an insignificant change to the experimental paradigm results in a large change of behavior. Now, it's, I, I agree that it's it's, it's my goal, maybe uh, 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 two years from now, uh, I'm not making any promises, it's, it's, it's recorded. So our goal as a community is to understand how to incorporate these seemingly minute uh, uh, manipulations that have a large effect on behavior. And at least the two models that I presented, I think are, are incapable of of of, uh, uh, of doing it. Just one comment because I was already close to the microphone. But uh, as you pointed out, for instance, in the example uh, where the subject said to throw the rods or to choose uh, in the context of the lamps, it's it's very different because in the context of the lamp, it's more complicated. It might be that some history of the stimulation takes it. You have to take into account, and in the context of the rod, you know that history of the stimulation. Of, of the choices would not play a role. This was, so, exactly, this was exactly the point yeah, yeah, that I was yeah, trying so to make, is that a, a subject enter with some uh, assumptions about the world, and... Right. Uh, and it um, completely changes the model. The, the, even the framework of the model can be changed just by the setting. What, I, what I'm trying to, to say is that there are existing ideas in the literature that we have in the brain parallel learning systems that maybe there are simultaneous systems that learn, and you arbitrate between them, and you always try to choose the one which kind of best fits uh, your, your data as a subject, what you get. So 
I think maybe a more general model is not necessarily a combination, maybe not one learning model, which is a combination of the two models, but maybe they exist in parallel and the brain arbitrates between them depending on the context. Well, at least in this, in this example, this would not be related to the data because I showed you an example where you presented exactly the same sequence and behavior was different. But you could say the setting was, what mattered was the setting and how to incorporate this setting in our model, this is a fundamental question that I think is, is, is much more important than whether we have Q-learning or poly direct policy. This, this would have a small effect. This would have rather a small effect on behavior. But how we, how we decide on this, this would have a large effect on, on, uh, on, on this would have the largest effect on behavior. This is, this is really frustrating for me because a qualitative psychology, in some sense, addresses it, and, and uh, which, which puts a question mark on the, on, on the value of the quantitative models that are derived from computer science, like the, the model that I described. Um, there was a point that I thought that I understand, and that was the point when you said that the difference between the two uh, um, behavioral paradigm was in, that in one, it was in a three, uh, or it was every now and then it began from the beginning, and in the other one it was continuous. When the rat ran from one to the other side, yeah. it was continuous. It was not a renewal process, or it was accumulated what you did. And it looked to me as if later on this accumulation is determined the fact that it's not anymore stochastic. So. No, no, if you would do a moving window, it would be very different from doing accumulation from the beginning to the end, and then you are all the time depending on the results that were before, and that was also the difference between the two paradigms. Is it makes, does it make no, sense? No, both models, you, you are right that there were differences in the reward schedule between the two. Uh, both models were stochastic, there was a stochastic component to them. Both models accumulated information about the past and used it uh, 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 to choose. But, however, I can take my model, used model that was built for one task, at least for the continuous one, and apply it to the other one, and I will get different results. Then this, was, this is not a good model for, for, for that behavior. Turns out that this is not a good description of the human behavior. This is... No, in both cases, you, you don't reach uh, choosing one alternative exclusively. It's not, it's not the case. Hey, may I? I wanted to ask Jonathan um, about the first impression effect that you showed. Do, do you have anything to say about the mechanism? Is it? It doesn't seem to be high, a rationalistic uh, decision making. Mechanism with respect to a, a normative mechanism, like why, what is it good for? Or the question is no. what's going on in the brain? What, what causing it? What co again, I, I, I'll answer what I know. I don't know what's causing it thinking about the brain. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is, is one, one advantage of, of a reset is it brings you to the, to the uh, right region. Makes sense? In, I mean, you can, you can argue that in the first trial you have no clue whether the reward would be uh, $1, $100, $1,000, $1, or a million dollars. This is, of course, not true, but conceptually. So a reset already moves you to the right region. That could be an, an advantage. It turns out that there are better things you can do. Well, you can do reset, but then have a learning rate that decays something like one over the number of trials. However, this is, uh, 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 if, if you look at behavior, such a decay of the learning rate is not observed. So this is really first trial, or first, first impression, more, more precisely. Yes? Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but uh, is it the, the criticism of uh, trying to look for correlation versus causality? So is it, are, are, you, are you making fun of correlation? We can always find correlation between a particular behavior. We can model the behavior and find some correlation in the brain. And, we have no idea if, it's, uh, if it has any causality between the behavior and the normal activity. 
Everything that has shown is, of course, correlation. There's no... Um, polar, polar social correlation between... Uh, so. but, but we don't know if there's a link, direct link, between what we observe in the brain and what we observe uh, as a behavior, no? No. <laughs> it's more complicated. It's, it, there were several things. One is these issues that don't enter the models. And this you could say this is a causation. When you do this change in, in the experiment, <laughs> you do this change and, and, and this is causation. This is one thing. And, and second, I think that we're not careful enough in uh, uh, relating these correlations or, or interpreting these, these correlations. That's, that's not that's a second. Yes. No, but, Do you want to react on this? No, but this, is my, this was my question. But first, before that, I wanted to say that I will not comment on Jonathan. Well, that, but tell, saying you, you are in very, very good shape in terms of theoretician, much better than I am. You are, and, but I don't have time now to tell you why we'll discuss this afterward. Because I want to because hear I eat non kosher food? What? I would like to hear Paul reacting on the last part of your talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm not really involved in the, the, the neural basis of uh, action value coding in the, in the, in the brain, but uh, I can understand that um, uh, most of his studies are more or less guided by uh, some uh, uh, representation or some um, model which are really, uh, we are really driven the kind of uh, modulation, neural modulation we are expected to find. And um, in this way, I think that uh, it's interesting to make a renewing about the, 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 the possibility to, to find other kind of, uh, of models, uh, some reflection <coughs> about the, the, the fact if it's really pertinent to make the correlation between the, the modulation of firing we observed and the possibility that they reflect really uh, the encoding of uh, as uh, Jonathan say, uh, really internal aspects of uh, behavior. Uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, can you expect that other aspects which are more internal and not really purely sensory or motor, I'm thinking about some memory aspects or some attentional aspects, can you expect that uh, you can find some, uh, some similarities, some uh, Differences, as you have shown, for example, for the, the, the problem around the action coding. Uh, you, you mean? I, I I cannot comment. I don't know enough. Okay. So, because I'm wondering why you 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 make a focus on the question of action coding because of your behavioral data only, or well, well, is it, if I, let, let me rephrase your question to see that I understand. So you ask me. Why, why do I pick on action value rather than on uh, other things? Yeah, other internal aspects of behavior, which... Perhaps for historical reasons. And, uh, but uh, may, maybe I, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, Ganela. So in, in, your, in your talk, you, you presented the, the idea of dopaminergic neurons as presenting TDL as, as a consensus. I, 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 here I do not disagree. I think that this is, and this is also what I teach, what I teach the students, uh, because it's, it is so beautiful. I think this is the main reason. It's elegant, it's beautiful. Nevertheless, in, in the last 20 years, there's accumulating evidence that it's much, 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 much more complicated than that. For example, the response, the similar response to a versus stimuli and, 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 and much more. So at what point in time we will say, okay, this was a very nice idea, consistent with the experiments of uh, Schultz 20 years ago. We had a lot of fun, but now we have to move on and, and, and consider something else because there's so much evidence against it. Still, this is a consensus. Well, first of all, it is not a consensus. taking the response as a single response and saying there's a short latency component, there's a saliency component, and arousal component has nothing to do with the coding part and the coding part works. 
At some point, at some point, I think we might be able to give up, but except for the model being beautiful, it is also very useful. So, so it's also useful, for instance, I mean, all fMRI work, basically, is, is finding reward prediction errors all over the brain, which is complete rubbish. But since it correlates with something, it only, you only need then, I mean, it's something that you know how it works. It could be not a TV error, it doesn't matter. It's something that you know how it works, and therefore it's useful, for instance, to find, for finding, I don't know, functional connectivity between areas that co-vary with some signal that might be complete crap, but, but it doesn't matter. Um, but since I have the microphone, can I ask you? <laughs> okay, this was, I get, now I understand that this was a mistake asking you a question, but you know, go on. Okay, I can use the microphone. It's too long. Uh, so so I, I don't completely understand your, your last result about the neuronal interpretation being problematic. Uh, uh, it was but, this neuronal interpretation yeah, yeah. being problematic. That's, that's but, all I have. For this new interpretation, would that mean that, that the non-stationarity that, that is in the, the uh, in the firing should that go vary in time scales with whatever it is you want to correlate with your internal variable? You, you can have a, a model of random walk, very very slow random walk, and you'll get the uh, neurons, large fraction of neurons that with these types of analysis would look like uh, action value neurons. Now, I'm not saying that but there are no action value neurons there. statistics could show you that. Well, but could, the, the, I mean, if all, you all analysis, shuffle your trials... You cannot which, shuffle your, your trials. The problem is that you're looking for a signal that slowly varies, so you cannot really do shuffling. Basically, the, the problem is that the effective number of trials, in quotes, is the, uh, uh, the number of blocks, not, not the number of trials. This is where this is where the this is the this is at the heart of the problem. Now it's it's a different. That's also easily solved. Just don't do blocks. But you have to learn the value. It's it's complete. Uh, there are ways. There are ways you can do. But at least to, to to the best of my understanding, and trying the different methods that different people use in the literature, I find uh, 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 what looks like action value neurons in random walk. I find what looks like action value neurons in covariance based synaptic plasticity, and the worst, I find action value neurons in Ellie's in dead cell. anesthetized neurons. Yes. Uh, just, just to be clear, you think that uh, one main point at the issue is the fact that uh, in the typical experiments, in order to assess action value coding, is a frequent shifting between different kind of uh, situations, which is. Uh, at the issue? Uh, I, sorry, I did not understand. You, you, ch you change when there is frequent change, for example, in the d levels of probability, something like that, in order to, to guide the choice? There are ways, there are potential ways of, uh, 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 of overcoming <laughs> this issue. Um, for example, um, well, it, it's, it's complicated. I mean, the, the, the issue is, 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 is uh, complicated and we're working on it. And, and of course, uh, the question, okay, what should you do in order to identify uh, uh, yes. action value neurons? But I'd like to, to, to like, emphasize that this is only the first problem. Even after you find these neurons that are significantly correlated, yeah. interpreting, saying that this is, I mean, you have these uh, uh, models of Doria telling you cortex is uh, finding the states and every every, Every level has exactly its function. I think that this is a, this is a big leap, given given the, the, the experimental data. Because my point is to know what can we do in order to make progress in the designing of the experiments, in order to be more convincing for. So this to go of for trial design rather than block design. That's this is a, for this problem. This would be the first uh, the first uh, step. For, for, for these things, it's rather complicated, but it's an issue. I mean, 
again, I, I raise a particular statistical issue for a particular uh, uh, case, and, and if, I, I cannot general. You ask me whether I, this is a general problem. I have no clue. I don't know about other about other experiments, other things. I don't know. But but I think that this is only with the first step, the first problem in interpreting. Even after you find these neurons that are correlated with internal vari variable, you have to. It, 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 the, the question is, how much of the variability in the firing rate can you explain by this internal variable? Are there competing models that are correlated, that also have correlated internal variables, and so on and so forth? I think we, we tend to, as, as a community, we tend to jump into conclusions uh, uh, too fast. That's, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's my point. Okay, just to make a short comment about the, the question of the usefulness of the temporal difference uh, model. Uh, I think that uh, we don't want to reject totally this model. I think that the main results in the l l last years is, uh, first of all, showing that uh, there's a heterogeneity in the dopamine neurons, but the main point, uh, dopamine system is not only concerned by the coding of the reward prediction error, and even at the level of the same neuron, there's a possibility to, to encode distinct signals. So it's a, it's a great point, suggesting that different inputs can uh, uh, drive the, the dopamine neuron. So probably the prediction error for the dopamine neuron is only one aspect of the role of the dopamine neurons. And uh, I don't want to reject this model. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. I, I, that's what I teach in, a, in my class. But, but mm. there, there are issues, and we, we, should, we should be aware that it's problematic. Yes, yeah, so, um, I would like to have two questions slash comments on what you say. First, um, and I think that's what Jean-Marc was trying to do a bit, I see, it looks like your point is like uh, uh, a peculiar aspect of the uh, correlation versus causality debate in some way. And it looks like you missed that. You, in your demonstration, you forget something very important, is that, for example, in, in few uh, uh, lesion or inhibits the auditory cortex of the rats of Ellie, uh, in, in your behavioral task, except if the task is uh, an auditory cue, but uh, in your behavioral task, the, the animal will still be able to continue the task. So, uh, we, we don't task. rely... No I understand, <laughs> ah, I understand, but that's what will happen if the, if the animal would be involved in the task, and you, did, uh, you do lesion of the auditory cortex, it will still be able to... So, this is, we know that there is some causality in, uh, in the neural network, in the behavior, also because of... Uh, the, the other, it's, uh, electrophysiology is not the only don't, element don't, we have. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I am not arguing that this brain region is not related to uh, uh, operant learning and to learning from reward. This is not the point. I'm saying that this very, very interesting and very, very specific statement that we have value-based learning, we have, uh, uh, and that these neurons are the ones that are responsible for learning of the value, this is something that... Uh, um, at least in, for the analysis that I consider, that I found in the literature, there are issues. That's, that's all. I'm not, yeah. I'm, not, I can't, I'm not even arguing that there's no action value neurons in, in this region. I'm just saying that this analysis should be reconsidered. Mm -hmm. That's all. But, but I think also that the fact that this question is asked is also um, related by the fact that the way we think about the brain most of the time is too much contaminated by uh, experimental psychology or behaviorism. We try to look for functions and if there is no function in the brain. There is emerging properties and those emerging properties uh, pro provoke certain behavior and that's it. And I think to look to specific function like uh, RPA, of course you have a nice correlate, but dopamine doesn't have function. It's, uh, it has some properties which are re related to some behavior and those behavior emerge from the interaction and the evolution of the system. So maybe it would be very stupid, but from everything that I hear about the system, most of the time what I hear is about single neurons responses. Isn't it a problem that you don't have access to the population because maybe something else is encoded at the level of the population that you don't have access at single neurons? For instance, variability. I mean, there are probably different solutions to uh, the same problem that the network is solving with uh, one way or another. So just by looking at one neuron, you just actually don't understand how the system is working. 
And I understand these are deep structures, it's very hard to go there. It's not a critique on the experimental component, but it's something maybe that we have to, huh? Eh? That's true. Seattle. That's true. Seattle. That's true. Seattle. Seattle. So, so, so it's 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 probably something to take into account to try to understand how the full network is working in these conditions, and that if we just look neurons by neuron, and if you try to generalize just from a single neuron, maybe there is just a problem there. I'd, really, for me, it's much too complicated for me to understand. But it's something that always pop out when I see the data. Okay, I think that's a question of the, the number of neurons we are able to, to record at the same time uh, at the subcortical su level. It's, uh, it's a bit different compared to the cortex. Uh, I think that the rodents, we have the opportunities from a technical point of view to use a different uh, uh, multiple tetrodes in order to, to, to find, to collect the maximal number of neurons at the same time, but uh, we don't have the at least for the, the recording of electro, electrophysiolog electrophysiological activity in extracellular condition, we don't have access, for example, in the Utah array or something like that. Okay. It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a big. Uh, um, it's, it's a huge task that you, you asked me to do. But, but I, I think that, well, having more data is, is uh, of course, uh, useful. But I, I tend to agree that this is perhaps uh, the goal of the theoreticians to say, uh, well, it, 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 take, take read cells, for example. I think that uh, Yoram here is an expert, but I think that no one, have, no, no one predicted so it's not that somebody looked for grid cells and, and said, ah, hi, here I found it. It was something that was suddenly somewhat, someone found regularity, and then, you know, then there's, there's a, the new field. Similarly, in, in, in the primary visual cortex, people didn't know what's going on. And then Hubel and Wiesel said, okay, are, we, we have a, a, a orientation selectivity, and suddenly we think that we understand what's going on in, in, in uh, the visual cortex. So it could be that if you, we had more data, suddenly a, a, a structure would emerge and, and we would say, aha, this was oh, obvious, this was obvious. It's more simultaneous. Maybe, maybe. Or alternatively, somebody would come up with a really good idea. I think that most, most advances in neuroscience were the experimentalists came and said, uh, oh, we found interesting regularity. Often by chance. In, in the case of the grid cell, the, 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 the trick was just to stop recording one, one square meter every nine, three by three. So yeah. it's actually not even recording more neurons. Yeah, yeah. It was just like a bit changing the way we do uh, experiments. The story that I was told about Jubel and Wither, this was by chance. I don't know if this is uh, correct. And they had some, some problem with, with, with one of the a, a stimuli that they were using that had these lines and then suddenly they saw it. I don't know if it's true, but yeah. So I have a very naive question, so I don't know much about uh, this, what you talk about and this model, but I was wondering about the way, I mean, the data collected for, for this task. How, how, do, how do you select the people that gave the data? Because I, it seems to me that not everybody has the same sense of value and it's in, in particular money. So do you, I don't know, I'm just considering the data itself without even going that deep that you go about neurons and, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I'm curious to know how the people have been selected. Uh, to know how you got, the, well, I mean, the, how, you know, where, what the data are from, like what type of people. I mean, I don't know. Well, this, this is a sociological uh, uh, question. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm of course grateful to those people who were willing, I mean, that did all the hard work and collected the data and eventually were willing to share it with me. And uh, no, I, I love data if anyone wants to give, collaborate with me to, to share with me data, that would be fantastic. Um, Historical reasons, basically. Well, well, 
But there was the idea in, in that experiment was that there was a lot of participants, no? So that there's probably variability in the way it values, but overall it's, it's based. If, if these are all students from the university, I don't think it reflects population. It's just the population of students. Okay, I mean, if I'm not. So, so your question is the validity of the data that I used? So I, I presented three data sets. One uh, represents uh, 200 students uh, from the Technion. One represents uh, several uh, rats in uh, Rutgers. And about the third data set, these are the anesthetized rats. That's Ellie, uh, Ellie here can, can say to what extent they represent the general population. It seems that part of the issue here is due to the non-stationarity. I, I don't think it's a peculiar issue, actually, because you make it uh, as if making correlation between complex uh, feature of a model and neuronal data. This may uh, make problems, but non-stationarity in the data is actually a core issue why you find a correlate in all the data that you look, right? So my question is, is there possibly a better null hypothesis than shuffling spikes as we usually do in experiments? Because this, because we break down the non-stationarities, and and is there a way to go beyond this like stationary null hypothesis, which we know is never going to be a good null hypothesis for a learning experiment, especially where nothing is stationary. <laughs> it's it's the it's a. It's too general for me. I can only comment on, no, no, on, on this test. case. On so this, for on example, this in, the, in, this, in this particular case that I was studying, one thing that the authors tried to do is to remove those cells that overall, throughout the experiment, had a change, a significant change in the fine grid. It's not good enough. It's, I mean, that's, uh, that's one thing that people often do to, to avoid uh, non-stationality. In this case, it's not good enough uh, uh, for this particular analysis. But you expect Bayern neuron to have significant changes over the experiment, right? Actually, I, I thought that you're still talking about the science paper. Yeah. They only include neurons that are modulated by yes. one event of the task. I think so. Too. That's what they say in the... Yeah. There, there was an issue of, or maybe, maybe it was a later a paper by Doya, uh, uh, that they remove non non what seemed like non-stationary neurons, because this, would be an, this could lead you to an artifact. In, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or in baseline firing rate. Pro, in the baseline firing. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a recording problem rather than. Well, I don't know if it's a recording problem no, or not, but no, this is it a. It could be a could recording be. It problem. Could be. Okay. But it could uh, be. Uh, and they also focus on particular kind of uh, firing, it seems. Yeah, yeah, this is only basic. Uh, exactly. So, so since uh, Frédéric Ansel apparently gallery, says that we have uh, time for one more question, so I'm asking one question about. Please, well, well, I can, or oh, no? I can. Okay. About the about the, the first part. I mean, the, the first uh, part where you were very frustrated with the two two descriptions. Okay. So, I mean, here here you are. Pointing at to, to a very fundamental issue in, in uh, doing to when you do theory, yes, because I mean you have other examples in science where you have two descriptions. It's not and the right comparison, but please yes, go on. Yes, and you know which one I'm referring to, yes. So this is well, yes, I'm going to say. Uh, so this is, uh, 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 for instance, a description of the, mo the motion of the of the planets. Yeah. So we have the first description, which was works perfectly well. Which is one of the ancients, yes, with uh, with uh, epicycle, epicycle, yeah? and we have another description which works perfectly well, which is the one which is after Kepler, yes, and I'm not the one who is ma making this remark, yes. So Poincaré made it, always Poincaré. So he's, he's in his in his uh, the, the article that has been quoted several times already. So he's saying, yeah, we have two descriptions, and both of them have the same. In that case, it's values. 
but we have to make a choice, yes. So in that case, he's making a choice, which is saying we are taking the simplest one. Now, in your case, maybe it's more complicated because the con I mean, it's I can say that in the in in terms of uh, uh, well, in fact, it's a bit similar, yes, because in one one description really makes calls for the I mean, it's purely uh, can say geometric, does not. Uh, speak about any force or anything, and the other one is related to a new notion which is underlying it, which is a force, yes, as a gravitation. So here, you are in the, bit in the same situation, yes? You have values and description without values. So, I mean, at, at first sight, you are in very good shape. I mean, you can, you can continue like this for years because but, so the, what is the very, I mean, the real problem that you have? This is what was not clear to me. You have good descriptions, and so your problem is that you, one of the descriptions introduces the notion of a value, and the other one does not. And so this would be for the next step, or what, what really bothers you? Well, the value is not a necessity of operant learning. This is something that emerges in a, a computer science models of Markov decision processes with exponential discounting or, or finite horizon. This is where you have Bellman, opti Bellman optimality equation and there you have a, a, a precise <coughs> definition of value and uh, you know that using value you would optimize, is optimal in the sense that it will, uh, 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 it's a way of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, maximizing uh, your, your goals. On average, so that's that's one. So this is one. But in in other po in other cases, when uh, temporal discounting is non-exponential, in partial in the cases of uh, partial yes. observability, this framework breaks down. Okay. This is in theory. Yes. Okay. Now we have uh, um, we have experiments. We have actual human behavior. And uh, it's, it's not written in, in the Bible that, we, we, that, that values are real. And actually, there are many yeah, it's experiments. Not okay, but so, 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 so it's not, so, so you are in very good shape here, in a way. I'm sorry? You are precisely in, in terms of, if you look at the scheme, yes, you are in very, very good shape. Because you have two alternatives, yes, which, and, and which with a, a profound difference, but which on the other side, on the other hand, they can explain. Uh, uh, things, both, yes, and then you can move on. I mean, and, it's, it's, it's and, the best and situation. And there's a third possibility. Science. There's a third possibility. So, and the yeah. third possibility is that uh, uh, our attempts to copy algorithms from computer science might not uh, uh, be helpful for uh, understanding human and animal behavior. That's a third possibility yeah. because things are it's complicated. It's everything. That's a third possibility. No, but you are, you are in very, very good shape here. This is what, what I mean, that you, you, the situation is excellent. That's the best situation for a theoretician. I think we should start there, right? So, thank you very much.